Good afternoon. Um, just logging in a little early. Hopefully everybody is able to see. Uh, feel free to throw in a comment or a question uh, if you cannot. All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is David Clerman. I am an assistant director of residential education at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And today we're going to talk about tips for a successful job search. Um, this will be approximately an hour and will include time for questions that are submitted and to be able to be answered. Uh, however, as questions come up throughout the presentation, you don't need to hold them through the, till the end. So feel free to be throwing them into the GoToWebinar go to webinar, um, question box. So uh, welcome. So a little bit about me and why I'm doing this presentation. Um, I have worked as an assistant director at UMBC for 14 years. And during that time, I have been the primary chair of the search process for our entry-level community director positions. This means that I am each year reviewing several hundred resumes and applications for these positions. Over the entirety of my career, which also spans to other institutions, are we supposed to hear? Uh-oh, people can't hear me. Um, All right, we're going to go ahead and test to see if people can hear me. Um, all right, 
seems like other folks are able to be in that way as well. So that is great. Uh, I think we have somebody named Tyler on who it's still coming up as not being connected to audio. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue on. Um, Sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, online learning is something that I think we are all going to have to start doing a really good job of knowing how to do uh, over the coming weeks. So um, effectively, over the course of my career, um, I have literally reviewed thousands of resumes and applications. Um, and so over the course of time, it's really easy for me to be able to see some of the things that candidates do really, really well and some things that can't um, necessarily translate into a successful position. Uh, and so my goal throughout this uh, time together is to be able to talk about the things that you can do as a candidate to help set yourself apart. And sometimes it really comes down to just a few things that you can do to really make that happen, um, as well as the things that can really torpedo your candidacy, things that we certainly don't want to see happen. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of why I'm doing this presentation. Um, a lot of times it seems like a job is in the middle of a maze and getting there, we have lots of wrong turns along the way, um, but it's not just about jobs um, because if we were just focused on a job, this would only be one dimension of our lives. In a lot of ways, it actually is jobs within the context of our career. We want to find happiness. Um, we want to be able to help people. and and so it can seem like a challenge to figure out something that's going to fit all of those and finding the synergy between those. And so there are some obstacles, especially as an entry level um, employee or even as a graduate person going into an entry level position that need to often be overcome. Um, some of them are, are asking the questions like, why are we doing the work? What is it re that's really driving you? Um, I think that there's also an obstacle out there that you have to find a job that you enjoy. Um, there's no question that we want jobs that we enjoy, but the bottom line is we also need jobs. And the things that you are able to do to find a position, oftentimes you're not gonna know whether you truly enjoy it until you're in it for some time. Um, another obstacle is if you are a recent graduate and you're still only thinking about theory and you don't have that practical experience, that can definitely be a challenge. Another obstacle is learning how to delegate and learning how to deal with finances. Those are two really important ones. And as you continue in the field for longer and longer, those are incredibly important things that need to be done. Um, we all know that our jobs are important, um, but organizations will do what is best for them. And so recognizing that you as a candidate always needs to do what's best for you, just as any organization is going to do what's best for them. Uh, sometimes there's a dream that I just want to make those important decisions. Um, I think if anything about the current uh, COVID-19 crisis that we're in tells you is that sometimes it's not so great to have to make those important decisions. And it's better left to those people who have more experience and more exposure. Um, politics play directly into that as well. Um, and so being able to navigate what that looks like. And lastly, um, Sometimes if there is a fear of change, you are at an institution and you're not sure you want to leave that institution because it's the only experience you know, uh, and that keeps you there, but it can also keep you trapped. And that then becomes an obstacle because if you only have experience from one point of view, from one institution of how they do it, you're going to be able to do that place really, really well. But most other institutions don't do things the exact same way. And so adjusting to a different process or expectations or system could be a bit more of a challenge. And lastly, money. Sometimes you focus on money. I don't think any of us went into this career for money, but it is still important that we have some. And so if we only focus on money, it's going to be a challenge um, and an obstacle to overcome. So when it comes to interviews, um, there's certainly a whole lot of information out there. And this is an article that um, I saw a number of years ago that I think is still pretty important. Um, but the job climate is changing. 
and we are becoming a more multi-generational workforce. And depending upon who the hiring manager is, you may have a baby boomer making those decisions. Um, in your interview process, you may have Gen Xers and other millennials. And so figuring out how to balance that professionalism because that has been a challenge um, more noted in a millennial workplace or in the millennial generation than it is for some other generations. And so uh, it's just something to be aware of um, as you work through your job search process. So I set out and did some research um, two years ago talking about what are some of the best and worst things that you have seen candidates do within an interview search process. Uh, and so that is what the bulk of this information is based on. Um, and we will go through a couple different areas. Uh, as long as I can go to the next page. Okay, so cover letters we're gonna talk about as well as resumes and references. So that's a lot of the written material. We're gonna touch on dress and nonverbal behavior uh, and as well as the interviews. And not only just in-person interviews, but video interviews as well. Uh, food and travel as well as communication. So all of these things play a role in the interview process. And so when we focus and start on cover letters, one of the things that's really important is that they need to be customized to the institution. Um, say the position specifically that you're applying for. List the institution name. Uh, we are the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I, however, every year receive applications that say, I'm interested in being a community director position at the University of Maryland, um, which for most people is down the road from our institution. And so, are you actually applying to the correct position at the correct institution when you're sending off those cover letters? And when you're doing a whole lot of bulk ones, uh, you have to be really, really careful to ensure that you are sending the correct letter to the correct place. A cover letter is an opportunity to share more than just what's in your resume. They are able to see your resume. What a cover letter does best outside of highlighting the key points that match what they're looking for with yours is talking about the why why this job? Why are you interested in this position? What is it that you're going to get out of it? What is it that they may be able to get out of you? That is the key point in a cover letter. It does not need to be extremely long. Uh, it's an introduction of touching on the highlights and really sharing what it is that is drawing you to that position. Um, I see less and less of form letters as time goes on, but every now and again, I do see some. And so try not to use them. I think Word has gotten rid of a lot of them, which is a helpful thing. Um, but they just look um, like a form letter. Uh, and so you lose some of that personality. Part of doing a paper application is that you as a candidate want to stand out. And so if you're using form letters, that's not going to help you do that. Uh, the last thing is for cover letters, as well as any other documentation like your uh, resume and references is to send them as a PDF. Uh, that is being shared for a couple reasons. One, uh, computers will automatically reformat Word files to the printer settings that are on the computer that opens the document. And I think for anybody who's worked on a resume and ensuring that you can pack in as much as you can on one or two pages, you have everything spaced just exactly. And so if it gets reformatted on a different computer, uh, it can throw things all the way out into a third page or something like that. Another thing, a reason for doing it is that it protects it. You, it can't be edited uh, so easily. Um, and so please try to send things as PDFs. Most application systems accept PDFs just as well as they do Word files, as well as a few other formats. Um, this is an example of a cover letter that I used in the past. Uh, it was for an internal position here at UMBC. And so one of the things that I want to point out is the masthead up at the top. This is what I have used uh, for a lot of years, basically to help be my image and my brand. And so this is the, at the top of all of my written documentation. Um, it's in good to include, if you have a specific name, to be able to apply for a job, to include that in here. And then specifically talk about the position that you are applying for and the location and maybe even how you became aware of it. And then you can go into an introduction as to how your strengths can match into the position. This is not the entire cover letter that I use. This is only a part of it. 
but I wanted to give a little bit of a heads up of what it can look like. I'm guessing all of you have done cover letters before, so this isn't going to be so much of a surprise. Um, when we move on, though, to resumes and references, there's a lot more differences there. For resumes, it is important to keep them to one to two pages. Um, as a hiring manager who's looking at a couple hundred resumes, I don't want to flip through a three or four or even a six page resume, uh, which I have gotten before, and it was from a graduate student. So somebody who didn't have full-time professional experience yet. Um, what that says is that the person submitting that isn't able to figure out what's important and puts everything in. They can't cut it down. Um, if somebody is being asked for their vitae or CV, that makes sense because that should have everything. But resumes should really be a summary. If you're coming out of graduate school, um, it is often going to be in that one to two page range. And for people who have worked in the field for a little bit, it'll be closer to that two page. It's really important not to ever embellish or lie. Uh, people ask. Um, if I know somebody who works at that institution, I may say, hey, tell me a little bit more about this. I'll be like, oh, they didn't do that. Um, don't do that. You are supposed to sell yourself, but sell it based off of the experience that you have. Your resume, as well as other information, such as cover letters, should be reviewed by many, many people. And when I say that, I'm talking about peers, mentors, family members, best friends. You know what you're trying to say in your cover letter and resume. If you give it to somebody else, are they going to understand what you are trying to say? Another reason is that our brains are so good that if we are reading something that has a spelling mistake in our brain, it changes it so it corrects it for us automatically because we know what we're trying to convey. Somebody else who is seeing it fresh for the first time is more likely to be able to pick up and notice that. Generally, it's a good idea to update your resume at least once a year. You never know when that dream job is gonna come along. Usually it's when you only have a day or two left before the deadline arrives. And if you need to be adding in a whole lot of information into your resume, uh, for instance, the entire job that you've been doing for the last couple of years since you've got that position, it could really put you in a bind. So try to update it at least once a year, not only so you can be ready to apply for that next job, but also so that you're not forgetting things. For references, it's a good to include your current supervisor. I recognize that some people don't always have the best relationship with their current supervisor, but one of the things that I am always going to ask for as a hiring manager is the contact information for their current supervisor. Uh, if it's not a great relationship, having that context is helpful, and I can view things by that uh, through that lens. It's great to be able to explain your relationship, and I'll show you how uh, I've done this in, in a couple slides. And then it's lastly, that proofreading, talking about that again and again, it, you can't really do it too many times. So this is a, an example of a resume that I've used in the past. It contains my education first. Uh, this is a personal style. Part of the reason I list it first is because jobs that I'm applying for at this point in time, they require master's degrees. So the very first thing that I'm looking at for positions that I am reviewing is because we require masters as i look for their education if they do not have a master's degree i don't look anymore um, because they don't meet our minimum requirements um, some people can put it in the end and that's fine because then you're forcing people to look through information but remember that if something is required and you don't have it you may want to save yourself the time from ever applying if it says preferred absolutely put your hat in the ring uh, because you never know what it's going to be. Okay. I also want to share a different format of a resume. This is from an application that came in a couple of years ago for one of our positions that I thought was different and neat. Um, it's still a bullet style resume, and so you can see the various positions and sections from work experience, student involvement, honors and awards, and stuff like that. Um, but being that it's set up in a column format really struck me because it's different. And part of what you want to do is stand out as a candidate. Uh, and so this is one of the things that really stood out to me. For my references, you can once again see my masthead. It is on all three pieces of documentation that I submit, and it looks exactly the same. 
it is important to have your name on your references sheet because if you just say references and list, if they are printing things out at their own institution and it gets separated from other documents, they may be, I don't know who this goes to. So having that information is a helpful thing. And then you can see me here listing out the relationship that I have with the various references that I've used which also includes my direct supervisor, my last former direct supervisor, as well as the one prior to that at my last institution. Um, ha being able to provide all that information makes it a bit easier for the reference check person to be able to get in touch with them however they need to. Moving beyond the paper stuff, let's talk a little bit about dress and nonverbals. Professional dress is really important, and that means dress as well as you can. Um, generally, it's better than business casual, and so try to stay away from the khakis, the sweaters, boots, and non-dress shoes. This does not mean you need to wear a, a three-piece button-down suit if you're a man or a, a ball gown if you are a woman, um, and I recognize that sits into the gender binary, um, and so it doesn't need to be either of those, to be very honest. The key is professional. And usually you can't dress too nicely, but it is very easy to dress too casually. Employers recognize that, especially with some of our newer graduate students, that there may be challenges around finances. And so that is not an excuse to come in wearing jeans uh, and a fashion tee, but what it does mean is you are potentially gonna be using other resources to furnish your wardrobe, such as Goodwill or other another secondhand store where items may be able to be found. A lot of universities are also doing clothing closets for students who are going through a job selection process. Um, one thing that, uh, especially for, for female identified people, is, is skirts that are too short. Um, while it may be comfortable, um, you also want to be ensured that you, you're getting hired for the right reasons for a position, and that can be a big turnoff for a lot of interviewers um, if they see that. So you tend to want to dress a bit more conservatively when it comes to a job interview. Um, it's important not to slump or lay back in a chair. You don't want to seem way too casual uh, or familiar or laid back um, or disengaged. You can certainly use the back of the chair. You don't have to have a stiff back the entire time, um, but just don't lean back or um, anything like that. Um, staying very close to the table is a really good thing. Another thing to keep in mind is to not act like a comedian. That doesn't say that you can't make jokes or make people laugh. Laughter is one of the things that helps connect people to one another. Uh, however, we are not interviewing for a comedy routine. And so if all you're trying to do is make people laugh and what you're sharing doesn't have substance about the experiences that you have had, um, that's really what the, the interviewers are looking for. So ensure that you have the ability to really talk about the experiences. Um, and lastly, turn off your cell phone. I do not say silence your cell phone. I say turn it off and that is very intentional. Um, remember, 15 years ago, hardly anybody had a cell phone and we were able to do interviews and communicate with people okay. But if you have your cell phone with you and it is on vibrate, um, we still hear the vibration and that can be a distraction within an interview. Um, you could turn it to do not disturb, so there is no vibrating, and that's perfectly fine. Sometimes there are breaks between various interviews, and so you'd have an opportunity to check if there's something important going on that really requires your attention. But when you are a candidate, an employer wants to know, are you focused on this with 100% of your time and your energy? Um, and if the answer is no, that could potentially impact your experience. Moving on to the actual interviews. Um, preparing and incorporating your prior experiences is really, really important. And so one of the things that I have done is I have come up with a list of experiences that I have had over my career. Uh, and I go in and try to update it uh, every so often with newer, fresher experiences. So for instance, I will hire light um, a section as supervision and explain some supervision experiences that I've had. I'll have another one on advising, another one on delegation, another one with a political environment or with financial decisions 
or working in a diverse environment, um, you are able to look at some pretty big headers as, and the way you can get those headers is by looking at the job description. What are the key things that that particular job is looking for? And then think about examples and times that apply to that subject. Um, you will often be asked to share experiences that you have had dealing with specific things. Sometimes it takes a while to think of those. So if you can do the pre-work ahead of time and have them on those sheets of paper that you can review before you actually show up for your interview, it's going to help a whole lot. Giving specific examples is incredibly important. And one of the things that you can do to um, not be as good of a candidate is just give generalities. Well, in that type of situation, I would do this, or I have done this. Try to give a specific example. Uh, that's really gonna let the interviewers know that this is something that you have done in the past. Answering questions completely is more about, uh, I, the way I often think is the way that we're taught to write essays when we are in um, middle school or high school. You have the introduction, you have the body, and then you have a conclusion. Uh, for instance, if I was to ask somebody, tell me about a time you had to deal with a crisis situation, they could technically answer that question correctly to say, uh, well, uh, there was this time in March 2020 when I had to deal with our institution's response to COVID-19. Um, technically, that's a time that they dealt with it, but that's not really telling more. So the body would be saying, well, what did you do? What was your involvement with the situation? What was the impact? The conclusion is the summary aspect of, and this is how the situation ended. This is what we would do differently or what I would do differently as the person involved. It's generally good not to a answer a question about a situation that is unresolved because having that closure is important. I would also say that if you were asked about a crisis situation to not talk about coronavirus because that's not gonna help you stand out at this point in time because everybody is dealing with it. And so thinking about other things that may happen on a more regular basis that would fall into that category. It's okay to bring a pad folio. Uh, this can include extra copies of your resume. It can also include those experiences that I talked about that you've written down and thought about, as well as a place for you to be able to write down the questions that they are asking you. Uh, sometimes they may ask a two-part question and it's okay to go ahead and write the various things that they're asking for. It is also a place where you could have the questions that you have prepared to be asking the various groups that you meet with. It's important to have institution-specific questions prepared. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so not just the general things. Uh, well, tell me what's the, your favorite thing about working here. That can be asked anywhere. Talk about what the institution has been dealing with lately. A good way of dealing that is to type the institution name into Google. And then instead of just looking at the results, go and click on the news tab and see what has been picked up lately. <laughs> a lot of it now is going to be around coronavirus, so you may need to dig a little bit deeper. Maybe this is going to focus on finances, an athletic team, a controversy. Maybe the institution was sued. Maybe they've created a new initiative that they're really excited about. The more research that you can show that you've done, it's going to pay dividends. Um, and once you get to an on-campus interview, it's often about fit at that point. And, and not about do you fit in with our team, but more about what is our team looking for to help? What can you add to it that we aren't? Uh, that we don't have right now. Additional information about food and travel um, we're going to cover right here. One is confirming the address and directions of where you need to go. This is incredibly important for candidates who come to our campus at UMBC because we, our entire campus, all the buildings, we only have one address, 1000 Hilltop Circle. Uh, and so if you were to put that into your GPS, it gets you to campus, but not to the specific building that you need to go to. So ask for those specific instructions. It's really important to provide way more travel time than you ever think that you're gonna need. At a prior institution, I had an interview uh, in the city next to each other. Uh, I, I was in Newark, New Jersey. My interview was in Jersey City, New Jersey. And I thought, all right, well, this isn't gonna be that big a deal. And I thought I gave myself enough time, but it's North Jersey and it was especially 
bad traffic that day and I arrived for my interview 15 minutes late. Uh, I did notify them on my way, but it wasn't a great way to start off the interview. There may have been an opportunity for me to recover. However, about 10 minutes into my interview, the building fire alarm went off and we then spent the next 45 minutes outside and there was no opportunity for me to do anything anymore. It is way uh, more important to that you are on time, uh, even if you're there for an hour, than to be uh, one second late for your interview. Um, if you get there early, go ahead and just be reviewing information, sitting in your car uh, or in a lobby or some other place on campus. If you happen to have a meal as part of your interview, uh, one of the things is that to keep in mind is to try not to drink alcohol. Uh, it may be that you, the people you interview with may drink, um, but things can get a little bit wonky, and so generally it's good to stay away from that. Also, to not overeat. Nobody wants to be sitting in a an interview for an afternoon feeling bloated and gassy. Um, and then also watch out for the sauces, whether this be salad dressings or pasta sauces or soups. Um, those, if they fall, could easily splash onto your outfit and it could be difficult to fix that before your next interview. It's also perfectly appropriate to ask about travel costs. Some institutions will completely cover the cost that it comes to an interview. Others will ask you to front the cost, and sometimes it will be a little bit of a split. Um, and then a reimbursement schedule may be on a complex matrix. Well, if we offer you the job and you accept it, we pay for it all. But if we offer you the job and you turn us down, well, you need to pay for it all. Or if we don't offer you the job, but we split the cost um, in half. So ask about that so you know what you're getting into before you are forking out what may be a couple hundred dollars, especially if a flight is involved. Communication is one of the key aspects of any process. And so if there's any area that I can emphasize more than others, it's about communication because resumes and cover letters are all about communication you being there for your interviews about communication as well. So having well-written thank you notes or emails, and I'll honestly say that really the focus is on emails. Those are perfectly appropriate at this point in time to be able to let folks know what it is that you appreciate. And I'm not saying sending a message saying, <coughs> I appreciate my time there uh, and I learned so much because that's really generic. Talk about the specifics of what you really enjoyed hearing from that specific person, because that's gonna make a much bigger impression on them than you sending a very generic thank you note. It's important to provide any timely responses when you are reached out to by an employer. Just as when you reach out to them and they don't call you back, it's just as frustrating as when, as an employer, we contact a candidate and they don't contact us back. Usually the general rule of thumb is within uh, one business day should be a response, especially when it comes to job offers. Uh, if you're looking to weigh several different options, uh, it's okay to say, can I have a day or two to think about this? Most employers will say, yes, it is. But if they also say no, then you have a decision to make and at least you know that you have that decision to make right then and there before they go ahead and choose to move on to someplace else. It's really important to explain why you want that specific position. And when I talk about the things that you can do to help set yourself apart from other candidates, this is probably the single most important thing outside of your previous experiences. When we ask this question, we rarely get very specific answers as to why individuals want to work in our community director position at UMBC. We get a lot of answers of, well, I'm looking for an entry level position. I would really like to be in the Baltimore DC area but they don't talk about specifics. Set yourself apart and talk about what it is specifically about that position that excites you. Interviewers wanna hear about what it is that excites our candidates. And we want people who are excited. Uh, and so that is the easiest way for that to happen. If there are make it or break it questions for you in terms of I wouldn't work here if X or Y, it's important to ask those prior to spending money, whether it's yours or an institution's, as well as time before you come. So the two most common ones are often about uh, live-in partners or children or pets. 
Um, and so if that is a make it or break it, ask that question before you get here, because oftentimes those are policies and not something that can be negotiated no matter how much they want to. Uh, for folks who are looking to go into graduate positions, it's great to know about graduate programs uh, that are associated with that institution um, and the types of arrangements that various positions have with those programs. Does it provide an actual assistantship, which helps pay for the education? Is there housing involved? Is there a meal plan? Are health benefits covered? Different schools have different compensation for the positions. A really timely topic to talk about is video interviews because we may be seeing a whole lot of these in the coming month. One of the things is to ensure that you have downloaded and installed the software. It could be Skype, it could be WebEx, it could be um, Zoom, it could be a number of things. Different institutions use different software. So ensure that you've downloaded it and then ensure that you've checked for updates prior to the day of the interview because sometimes there are updates that need to run in order for it to load successfully. Um, and so don't wait until the time of your interview to start loading things up. It's still important to dress appropriately for that um, because you are still being seen on a video. So dress professionally. Wearing headphones can cut down on the excessive noise that may be heard for background. So if you're not in a private space, that would be highly encouraged. If you are in a closed office space where there isn't any of that extra noise, that's probably not necessary. It's, be thoughtful, it's important to be thoughtful of what's going on around you. So in some of the Skype interviews that we've done, people have done it in their apartments, and then we see a cat walk around, uh, likely their pet, uh, in the background. Um, I recognize that they might, may not be able to help that, um, but it just is interesting, uh, an observation of, oh, okay, and it could be distracting for the folks who are interviewing. I've also done Skype interviews with people who are in hallways. Uh, instead of an actual closed space, and so you can hear some other sounds around them. Uh, it's also really key to use Wi-Fi because that signal is likely to be better than any cellular signal if folks are using their phone or, or a tablet. Um, that's likely going to provide you with the best connection possible. Some of the red flags that we would like to point out are bashing your current or previous supervisor or workplace. Um, I recognize as an employee that not every situation is going to be ideal and that there are going to be challenges with either individual people or entire um, departments or institutions. Talking about it in a negative light is not going to help in an interview. As an interviewer, I question, oh, wow, they're saying this about the place that they currently work. What if they don't like it here? Are they going to say the same things about me? It's okay to say that me and my supervisor have had some difficulty. That's appropriate. Talk about what you did to navigate that difficulty. What did you, how did you approach the situation? Where did things improve uh, as you moved on? Um, it's generally not good to say, yeah, it really wasn't good. Um, well, what did you do about it? Well, we, I didn't really do anything about it. Um, so talk, we don't want people in that situation. So if you are in a difficult situation, it's important to try to work through it because you may encounter another difficult situation, maybe not with your supervisor, but with a colleague um, in the future. Another red flag is if no questions are asked. Uh, that kind of implies that either there's no interest or that the candidate thinks that they know it all. And so ask some questions. That's also where that research can come into play. Um, don't make things up. I already touched on that. Don't focus just on the salary and the perks. Um, once again, we didn't really join this career for the money. Um, it's important to ask the important things, if things are live-on position, what that may be like, but just don't focus on it. Another thing to be watchful for is taking too long to answer questions. Um, sometimes you are asked a question and it's in three parts and that might take you a moment to think about. It's perfectly okay to say, oops, sorry, to ask, hey, I, I have a question, uh, or I need you to repeat the question, please, or to write down some notes. It's also perfectly appropriate to say, that's a really great question. Do you mind if I take a moment to think about it? And that can probably buy you 10, maybe even 15 seconds. However, if it goes to 30 seconds, it's probably going to be a little bit weird at that point. Um, so that's why the prep work that you can do may be really helpful in answering and thinking about some examples 
even if you don't have that specific situation, think about something that may be connected to what they are specifically asking of you. Another red flag is if you are not preparing your references for calls. References often happen after the interview, but sometimes they can happen before an on-campus uh, interview. It's important to ensure that your references know that you are applying for a job and that you are actually interviewing for a job. Send them the, your most updated copy of your resume. Tell them about the things that are really exciting or that, that you would like them to focus on as they give their reference. Your references are your biggest cheerleaders within any job search process. So not telling them that you're interviewing or that they are even a reference can really be a detriment. <clears throat> so moving on to kind of, if you want the next position, there are several things that you should be doing. One is learning as much as you can. This could be through seeing uh, the Chronicle and seeing the emails that come across daily on the updates for that or other news that is impacting higher education and especially housing and residential life if, that, if that's the area you're going to stay in. Um, you will not get as much training as you move up. Um, much of what we learn is on the job training, um, but the structured training significantly decreases as you move up in a, an organization. Um, make presentations similar to what I'm doing here. It's going to give you confidence in talking in front of groups of people. It's also going to cause you to do research so that you ensure that your presentation is inclusive of the really good points. Um, another thing that is really important to do is to own up to your mistakes. Accountability is one thing that a lot of people struggle with and saying that I made a mistake um, and we let pride get in the way. Everybody makes mistakes and being able to say, you know what, I didn't handle that situation the best way that I could have. This is what I've learned from it. And if I encountered that situation, I would handle it differently. Um, so it's okay to talk about that. Um, communicating is really important. So being succinct without going on and on and on. You probably know those people in your life who if they start talking, it's 10 minutes later before they actually take a breath. So be certain that you know those people. On the flip side, if you know that you are a person who doesn't like to talk a lot, practice and try to get comfortable with that. We only have one opportunity to make a good first impression, so ensure that's a good one. Um, at conferences, that can get a bit challenging um, because sometimes people, especially if coming from grad programs, you're out with your friends and you have a few drinks because, hey, interviewing for jobs can be tough and you want to let off some steam. But if then you interact with somebody that you're going to interview and you may be a little tipsy, you may not be able to take that first impression back if they notice. Uh, read, read things, once again, within the news, within periodicals, within magazines, such as the Makuho magazine, the Akuhoi talking stick. Know what's going on. It's also good to always be looking for your next job. You likely know what you really want to do. Find that dream job and then see how you line up on the experiences that they are looking for. Do you check all the boxes? Are there other experiences that you can get to help check those boxes? Um, share your accomplishments within your resume as well as as you're talking to people as, as appropriate. Um, a resume and interview process is not a place to be modest. If you don't share things and toot your own horn, nobody else may either and you can't depend on that happening by your references. And then once again, keeping that resume up to date uh, can be really, really key. So sometimes conferences are a way to get some additional experiences. Um, and sometimes it's where there's also the job searches. So we've already had the Mid-Atlantic Placement Conference that happened in February for Makuho, and then ACPA happened at the beginning of this month. Uh, yesterday, TPE and NASPA have canceled uh, due to the coronavirus outbreak, but there are other experiences that will be happening later this summer between the Regional Entry Level Institute, the National Housing Training Institute, and ACU Hawaii. At least they are all scheduled to be happening at this point in time. And so conferences are an opportunity to get additional experience. Training institutes are even better because they are intensive and um, a small population that attends these to be able to build some skills. At conferences, if you happen to go to another job placement conference, 
these are just some things to be keeping in mind. Um, you can be easily be overwhelmed by the thousand jobs that are posted, so you have to be specific. Um, always bring copies of your resumes and references. Stay hydrated. That is incredibly important to be able to um, talk. I My voice has gotten a little dry during this presentation, but I have a water bottle right next to me, so I'm not coughing the entire time. Um, I already talked about watching what you say and what you do. Pacing yourself is important. Some people are really prideful and be like, yeah, I had 25 interviews and they are probably exhausted and I'm not sure how well they did in those 25 interviews. So give yourself some breaks. It doesn't need to be an hour long break between interviews um, and, you, and it's okay to do some back to back interviews, but recognize the impact that it can have if one interview goes long by five minutes and then the next one that's back to back also goes over by five minutes and it's hard to catch up. Um, if you are sent uh, electronic resources or actually given hard copies of materials at a conference, you should take some time to review them. They may ask questions specifically about them, so go ahead and set some time. And then it's always a great thing to practice. Practicing interviewing um, with a colleague, a peer. Uh, graduate students are also able to use career services or centers on their own campuses. Um, oftentimes they can be recorded and you're able to notice the things that you are doing that may be second nature to you, like playing with your hair, clicking, uh, playing with your fingers, clicking a pen, saying um, a whole bunch, whatever it may be. Uh, those things can be pointed out to you by somebody else. A couple helpful job search sites that you may want to be aware of. Even though the placement exchange is not happening in person this year, it is still an online search site and they are still doing online interviews through that service for this year. Um, a lot of the other ones don't offer that level of service, but they do list job postings. And so it's a great thing to be looking at these. Um, and sometimes some institutions only post at one of these. For instance, UMBC will only post at higheredjobs.com. We don't post at most of these others. So looking at the variety of what they are is a great way. You can also set many of these up to automatically send you emails uh, if you have a filter for a particular location and a particular uh, area, such as residential life and housing um, in the mid-Atlantic region or something like that. And so that way it makes it even a little bit easier for you. Um, that takes us to the 50 minute mark essentially so i want to turn over the remainder of time for any questions or comments that, uh, that folks have that we can answer so uh, go ahead and type it in if you would like um and actually i can unmute people so i will do so if you have any questions you can verbalize them um so one said, what advice would you give to someone who is in their first full-time job and is looking to move on to their second position at another institution? So um, part of it depends. Uh, is this looking for another entry-level position, in which case it would be lateral, or it could potentially be moving up to a more advanced position? Um, in either situation, most of what I've shared is appropriate. Um, Moving into a mid-level position is more challenging because we have a lot of entry-level people and then not nearly as many mid-level positions. And those individuals will often not leave in the same type of frequency as entry-level staff, which is one of the reasons that our industry has a high level of attrition and people leave at within three to five years. So that is also causing entry-level staff to look for a lateral move that may give some different experiences. Maybe it is a different type of institution going from a public large research institution to a smaller public institution or a private institution. Maybe it is one where there is um, collateral assignments that you have some responsibility for, so you get to oversee training or student staff selection, whereas in your current job that you, you don't. I will say that smaller schools will provide more opportunities for experiences than larger schools because larger organizations typically have more people to do the work. And so maybe there's a specialized person for training and selection only. Whereas when I worked at a previous institution, I was one of four full-time staff members. And so I had my hands in every single thing from housing selection, 
to room changes to training and selection every single year on top of the regular day-to-day -day operations. Um, if uh, it, it sometimes can be good to let your supervisor know that you are looking to to move and to hear what it is uh, to share what it is that you're looking for. Is it that the current institution can't fulfill that responsibility? Or is it that it's just not a good fit and a good environment for you and you're looking for a different experience? Being able to talk with mentors is really important, but talking to your supervisor as well, because when it comes to you having an on-campus interview, it's generally good to let them know that that's happening. Um, but if it's something that they can correct to make your experience better at your first institution, it may, and you are willing to stay there, it may be good to ask about that. Hopefully that answered the question. Any other questions? Uh, another question, with COVID-19 causing more interviews to be online or via phone, how would you recommend someone getting a good feel for a department slash team if the on-campus interview is being done online? Um, that's an amazing question that is going to be really challenging for me to answer. Um, we are in this boat ourselves. We actually did Skype interviews today for our first round interviews, which is what we typically do. But when it comes to the next phase, which tends to be on-campus interviews, we as an institution don't know what that's going to look like yet. And I'm guessing a lot of other departments don't know either, because part of the residential life experience is, well, let me see the campus, the place where I'm actually going to be living, or um, the environment. Um, like that, that's really important. And I'm not sure how that's going to be repl replicated. Um, I think the best thing that might be able to be done here is to really ask some specific detailed questions um, as so you are able to get the feel and the information that lets you be comfortable with what it is that you're trying to understand and get a feel for. Um, we are just in an unprecedented time at this point, and um, I have a feeling that there's going to be a number of online selection processes that happen over the course of the next month as institutions say you can't bring people onto campus. Or even if you can, their experience is going to be limited because students may not be here, and so maybe they're not interacting with students. So are there ways that you can replicate experiences without being physically present, some of which you absolutely can? you can still interview with students online through any number of applications. But can you replicate what it's like to walk around the campus for that feel? That's going to be really tough. And part of the reason that it would probably change um, in addition is even if we brought a candidate onto campus but students aren't here, the feeling is very, very different. It's not an accurate feel of what the campus is like. And so there's going to be some, some risk and some leaps of faith that are going to have to happen through this selection process, not only for candidates, but also employers. Uh, if you're interested in moving into a different region or city, is it okay to mention that during the interview? I don't want to come off as being only interested due to location, proximity to family. Um, it is okay that you are interested in moving to that specific area. But don't let it say, well, I wanna be closer to family and that be the only thing. Because once again, an employer wants you to be interested in working at that institution. Um, they want you to have that wholeness and that wellness of also having your personal life satisfied. And, and in this way that could be met uh, through being closer to family and friends. But talk about what it is that job has that really interests you. Um, you can say, in addition, I want to be in the area because of this, but don't let that just be the only thing to say. That's the challenge that I see with a lot of people. They only talk about that aspect and not about the other things. It would really be good to know, really go onto the website and look at mission statements, look at the various initiatives. Are people doing restorative practices? Um, do they have um, curriculum style learning? Do they have faculties and residents or LLCs or other initiatives that really stick out as being something different? And how can you dig into that a little bit more? Talk about those things. Uh, 
All right. Uh, any other questions before we go ahead and wrap up? All right. Uh, last one. When making a jump from residence life to various other departments within student affairs, what are some transferable skills that people may not think to share? Um, it's difficult to say what people may or may not think about. Um, and so this is what really comes down to transferable skills and looking at what the other area within student affairs is looking for, um, whether it be career services or counseling, health promotions, um, or campus life. Uh, those tend to be, I think, the big ones. Um, maybe there are a couple others that I'm not mentioning. Where are the transferable skills that you can talk about that relate to the jobs that they are looking for. So if it's planning, program planning and student engagement, having some really great experiences to be able to talk about, as well as the other things such as, and this may be getting to the answer to the question, assessment. We do a whole lot of things, but assessment usually is not one of the areas that people are very comfortable with or that we do well, not only as individuals, but even as departments, divisions, and universities. So assessment could be one of those um that stick out working with diverse student populations and the various needs uh that students are coming with that often may not be there either um, as a transferable skill it's important our, our student body continues to get more diverse as the years go by and their various needs um, also change and so talking about how you have worked with students from different needs, um, creating not only an environment where diverse people are welcome, but included. So how are you creating inclusive environments so people want to be part of things? And so I think I eventually got to the answer. <laughs> so I wanna thank you for your time today. Um, I can certainly uh, answer additional uh, comments uh, and questions I don't think I put my email into this presentation at all. So um, it is my last name, C-L-U-R-M-A-N at umbc.edu. And I am happy to review cover letters, resumes, and other documentation uh, to provide a, some feedback. So best wishes as you um, and your campus and department respond to COVID-19 and the impact that that's going to have on you and your students uh, and best wishes in the job search. Really appreciate you joining us today and have a wonderful day.